All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the 815 Exchange. I am your host, Chris Crenshaw, and we are live from the 336 once again for episode 174. And this is this is going to be one of those one of those episodes with a particular segment, of course, which is college football. That's going to uh, it's going to go down in the annals of history of this channel. All right, this is this is one of those ones. Okay, this is one of those ones. So go ahead, let's get it out of the way. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. If you guys are enjoying the content, and as always, my social media links are provided. Everything you're looking for can be found in the description, and timestamps are embedded in the description and in the video, so you can skip ahead to whatever segment you would like to look at. But like I said, this is a uh, this is going to be one of those episodes, of course. And of course, with that said, we are starting off with college football. Let's not waste any time. This is going to be very, very long, okay? We're starting off with college football, and it was an interesting week in college football. It was a little bit of an OD to this past era, right, that ends this year of college football as we knew it, with different conferences and different regions and just it, the, the balance, right, or the perceived balance, should I say. It was the end of an era. It was an OD to some of the greatness of college football, but it was an also an OD to the corruption of college football. And of course, that came with the CFP committee's top four teams that are going to the playoffs, which we will talk about at the conclusion of this segment. But before we get to that and everything that entails that, let me set the stage. We did have games this week, so let's talk about them. Starting off with the last ever game in the history of the Pac-12. The Pac-12 championship, the long-awaited, the highly anticipated matchup, the rematch between Washington and Oregon, of course, led by the two great fifth-year quarterbacks, Michael Penix Jr. and Bo Nix. And honestly, Penix went, what, 27 for 39, 319, a touchdown and a pick. It was an okay game, all right? It's been a series of okay, game, okay games for Michael Penix Jr. Bo Nix got exposed a little bit as a little bit of a check down merchant, shall we say. Bo still had in this game 21 for 34, 308, three touchdowns, one pick, but that completion percentage is a little bit of a mirage. Like I said, he does have the lowest yards per attempt of any elite quarterback in the country. And while it was listed as Penix versus Nix part two, this game was widely decided by one man, and that one man has come up clutch so, so many times for the Washington Huskies this year, and that was Dylan Johnson. 152 yards and two touchdowns. He also went two for two, five yards and a touchdown passing. Did DJ, but Dylan Johnson once again steals the show, and Washington wins the last ever Pac-12 championship, 34 to 31. They advance to the college football playoff where they will be ranked. We'll talk about it. All right, but Washington gets it done. Uh, Jalen McMillan was the star wide receiver, or one of them, uh, this week. Nine receptions, 131 for Jalen. Roma Dunze, all right, how many, how many straight weeks? Might, might just need to be a top 10 pick at this point, all right? How many straight weeks have I talked about Roma Dunze being the guy, the actual, the guy? Like, even past the headlines that might get the real guy on this offense is Roma Dunze. I've said it, and I'll say it again here. Eight receptions, 102. He's the catalyst. He is the catalyst on that offense. It's often not, well, not often is it a receiver, but on this Washington team, even with a great quarterback, he is the catalyst. He is that special of a player, and he was special once again. You know, and, and it just kind of came down to Washington controlled this game. Not in so much as we'll talk about in the SEC Championship and what happened there, but Washington controlled, they got off to a lead, they were able to hold on, and even when Oregon really tried to make that comeback in that second half, in that third quarter, in that fourth quarter, tried to make it close, made it close, Washington, because they built that lead, because of the way they started this game, they were able to prevail, got the necessary stops, and were able to hold on, and they got a well-deserved Pac-12 championship. They were the class, all right? They were, honestly, you could dare say class of the country this year. It was a phenomenal season in the best conference, all right? The best conference in college football this year. Washington runs the table. They win the last ever championship from the Conference of Champions. And that brings us, of course, to the Big 12, which also will be undergoing stark, stark changes going next year. So the last Big 12 championship, as we know it really, was won by an SEC team to be Texas. Hook em horns. They get it done. Quinn Ewers had a magical game. All right, he had a magical, by the way, I think the WWE um, endorsing this was super dope. 
I, I love that idea. I love that organization. Undertaker, Jay Cargill, Samantha Irving. I think uh, Drew McIntyre was there too. Just kind of everybody. I think that was really dope. He got the belt. It's like the we need more belts as trophies. All right, maybe it's just because I'm a wrestling fan, but we need more belts as like trophies. All right, because it's just it's sick. All right, especially as like a player of the game. Like it's just it it just it's so sick. All right, it's such a cool like imagery of you like having the belt. So anyways. I thought that was dope. Uh, Quinn Ewers went off. All right, Quinn went off in this game. He went off in a fashion that makes you think, all right, maybe he's not coming back next year. All right, M maybe he ain't. Maybe it is Arch's time, okay? Because Quinn played like the Quinn Ewers that you were promised when you saw his recruiting ranking. 452 yards, over 300, I think over 350 actually of that in the first half. Four touchdowns and only one pick. So only one mistake for a near perfect game for Quinn Ewers. Monster game. Uh, Keelan Robinson, by the way, went off in that second half. It was just kind of representative of this game. Of course, most of this was at 57 yarder, but nonetheless, four carries, 75 yards, and two touchdowns is an insane stat line for a running back. He did a great job closing the show. A.D. Mitchell could not be stopped. Six receptions, 109, and a touchdown. Uh, Jatavian Sanders, I've said, is one of the best tight ends, and a guy I really like as a pro tight end potentially with his. talked very positively about Ollie except for one game where he just kind of ghost towned it after I was like yeah well, maybe he should be in Heisman convos yeah that's all day all right he had 34 yards rushing this week um Texas shut him down shut down Ollie Gordon and honestly he kind of earned it with the whole you know the pregame the F Texas um just kind of chanting and then during the game, I mean, it was a crazy sequence of events, right? An absolutely crazy sequence of events. I was watching this with my boy Kobe, and I was like, him going from, you know, F Texas in the pregame to then they're getting blown out. He's frustrated, throwing his helmet, screaming, and then the, like, visual of him injured. I mean, just a crazy, a crazy sequence of events for Ollie Gordon. But even though he was one of the best running backs in the country this year, certainly not in this game. Texas had his number. And yes, uh, a really cool moment at the end, by the way, Arch Manning and Jonathan Brooks, who still suited up, even with the brace, um, for that last kind of uh, kneel, Arch took the knee down, and then he gave the ball to Jonathan. I think that was just a really cool moment for Texas with what Jonathan Brooks meant to that program this year and went to that team. It's just unfortunate that, you know, the ACL went like that. In the game, he played really well, really, really well in. And that could have, you know, inflated Texas's chances, you know, even more here as we go to the college football playoff, which they are in. But... Nonetheless, Texas, one last time, Big 12 champions. SEC championship. This is so fun. This is so fun considering what I'm about to do in like, you know, a couple minutes. This is just so fun to talk about. Alabama gets the win, 27-24. to uh, Maybe to the surprise of some people. Not really to the surprise of me. I, I feel like I said at some point in time, I said... Actually, not, I think. I, I said Georgia was getting clipped. I know everybody saw, like, the record, you know, almost 40 straight games won, right, or whatever, 30-something, whatever the streak was, and was like, yo, they started balling again, right? They, they, they're beating up on, you know, ranked teams again. And everybody's like, oh, it's Georgia. But if you've watched this Georgia team, you know this is not, this, this was never the same Georgia on the level of dominance as their freshman year and sophomore year. It was never that same level of dominance. Never. Look, may have looked like it had flashes, but it was, it was never that same caliber of team. I could have told you that coming in. And this was the game. 
This was the game where they got clipped, and the worst nightmare that could happen in college football has happened. Alabama wins the SEC championship 27-24. Jalen Milrow was two-faced. I mean, he's two-faced. He is the epitome. He's the most volatile player in the country. As we always say, either greatness or mediocrity. There's no in-between. 221 and two touchdowns. So it wasn't, you know, the level of greatness that maybe we've seen from him at certain points down the stretch here, as I think he's one of the most improved players in the country this year. So not elite, you know, Milrow, but he did enough, especially in the clutch, um, getting those first downs. So, yeah, 221 and two touchdowns for Milrow. Really, this came down to the defense. All right, this was a great defensive performance for the Alabama defense. Seven TFLs. They were causing that Georgia offense all types of problems. Um, Carson Beck got exposed a little bit, I would say, in this game in terms of some of the weaknesses he has. And like I said, that front seven is just lethal. Jalen Walker, though, somebody on the Georgia front seven, uh, he had a game. Two sacks. I think he's going to be a great NFL player. I feel like we've been talking about Jalen Walker as a key member of this Georgia defense forever. And maybe it has been forever because he's been a contributor since he was a freshman. But yeah, two sacks in this game. But that missed field goal, ultimately, I think what undid and kind of changed this game was that missed field goal on the possession Georgia had right before halftime, where they also had a penalty to push it back to 50 yards, I think the field goal ended up being. That missed field goal and then the fact that Bama was allowed to go down the field and score that touchdown to make it 17-7, to I think that really altered the course of this game for Georgia. You get that field goal, right? It's, you know, 10 to 10. Completely different. But 17 to 7, two score game. They were playing catch up the rest of the way. And Alabama and Nick Saban did a great job controlling this game and shutting down. Like I said, that defense helped control this game for Alabama. And that is why they won. Will Riker, by the way, got to give a shout out to the Alabama kicker. Became the all time scoring leader. And I know he's a fifth year. But I do want to say, honestly, give a little credit to this record. Because uh, he only kicked, I think, seven field goals his freshman year. So, yeah, most of it's done over four years. I have no problem with that. All-time leading scorer in the history of the NCAA, at least in Division I, Will Riker. Shout out to him. Bama wins the SEC. Michigan wins the Big Ten. Yes, there was going to be no funny business this week between Michigan and Iowa. All right. And they still hit the under, though. Still hit the under. So, shout out to Iowa. Still hit the under. Ever since he switched over, he has been great. All right, he has been great. He, even almost at times more so than a Will Johnson, is an integral member of that defense. They do not function with Sandstrom not playing at the level he is. They are not Michigan without Sandstrom. So yeah, shout out to him. He was great in this game. Four sacks as a team for Michigan. Tory Taylor, I want to give some shout because that's the only person I can talk positively about from Iowa because it was that type of game. But they're a great putter who should probably win the Ray Guy this year. Um, 30 for 86. All right? 30 of his 86 punts this year have been in, downed inside the 20. That is over a, I think over a third of his punts down inside of the 20. I mean, that's remarkable. Absolutely remarkable for the Aussie. He is going to make some NFL team unless his powers get zapped. Very, very happy with the punting situation next year. But yeah, I had to give a shout one time to the Iowa legend. If this is the last time we probably talk about Iowa, got to give a shout to the boy Tory Taylor, the best player. And uh, yeah, Michigan rolls. No surprise there, though. Florida State handles Louisville 16-6. to This was a little bit of a grind. Tate Roadmaker was out for this game. So Florida State was now down to their third string quarterback, right? Brock Glenn, who I don't know if he's done a pass all year, besides practice, the freshman, down to him. So Louisville, a very solid Louisville team, by the way. I don't know why everybody's acting like this was like a garbage. This is a very solid, near top 10, if they weren't 10th, actually, Louisville team. And it was a grind, all right? It was not a pretty game to watch by any means, all right? Glenn looked very much so like a freshman. I think he went 8 for 21, under 100 yards. It wasn't a great game, all right? But the defense for Florida State found a way to win because that's what matters. Or at least that's what should matter. But that's what matters. Find a way to win. And Florida State is a great team. They found a way to win. They, they used their circumstances to their advantage. They used that great defense that they have. Jared Verse, 
was a monster. Lawrence Toa Philly was a monster. All right. Braden Fisk was a monster. Toa Philly, by the way, 118 and one touchdown. Yeah, I got brought up the stats right here. Eight for 21, 55 yards. Toa Philly carried the Rock to Florida State, 118 and a touchdown. That's what you got to do. Run game moves. Pass game ain't working. Run game moves. And they did it effectively. Did enough to win the game. Should matter. Braden Fisk, by the way, like I said, nine tackles, three sacks, four and a half TFLs. And, of course, Jared Verse is going to be making a lot of money very, very soon for hopefully your favorite team. Six tackles, two sacks, and three TFLs for the future first rounder in Florida State. Get it done. They win the ACC, the last ACC championship as we know it. And now with the stage set, that brings me to... What you clicked on this video for, probably. All right, this is probably why you're here. I understand it. It's what I hyped up at the beginning of the intro. This is why you came, all right? This is what you're here to listen to. If you're my friends watching, this is what you're here to hear me talk about. If you didn't, just, you know, ask me over the weekend. And that, of course, is the final top four rankings for the college football playoff. Also, the announcements of, you know, who's going to the college football playoff, right? Top four was revealed. And honestly, I'm, I'm glad. I'm in a way I'm glad I am glad that it's all out now I'm glad that we don't have to pretend anymore I'm glad it's all out in the open for everybody to see right we don't have to pretend under this pretext of fairness or the best or however you know we want to justify or whatever reasons that Boo Corrigan and this cultural ball playoff committee is coming up with you know as reasonings to how they concoct these rankings. I'm, I'm just glad it's all out in the open for everybody to see and we don't have to live with this image of, of this mirage of what this is supposed to be or the idealistic version of what the CFP rankings are, right? I'm glad we don't have to do that anymore. I'm glad that the committee finally, the one good thing that came out of this is that the committee finally had to show their cards, their true cards about how this is run and how this is going Finally, the only thing is that they're still committing to this lie. They're still committing to the mirage because they're cowards. All right. They're cowards. They're cowards. But we've known this. We've been calling them cowards. If you watch this channel, if you've been around, if you heard me talk about college football for the past, let's say two and a half years since conference realignment really kicked off and we started converging into these really, let's be real, two super conferences. It's a power two. it's a power two. these people do not care about college football. That's never been more apparent than it was yesterday after the rankings were revealed. These people do not care about college football. And I'm not censoring any of this. They don't give a fuck. They do not give a fuck about this sport. I want that out in the open before I even talk about any of this. They don't give a fuck. They don't care. They care about this. That is the reality. That is the reality of this day. That's all. That's all that matters. Super conferences, the CFP committee, that's all that matters. These people don't care. Do not believe that mirage, that dream, that, oh, these super conferences, these, these big name schools, UCA, USC, UCLA, Washington, you know, Texas and Oklahoma to the SEC, they're coming for competition. They're coming to be a part of the, the, the best. No, they're there because that's, you know, these fat TV contracts that you've been witnessing the past few years. That's why they're there for the money, for the money. This is a business. They don't care. They don't care about the culture. They don't care about the rankings. They don't care about fairness. They don't they care about money. They care about money. Cash rules everything around me. I think Wu-Tang said that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, maybe. And it's true. Cash rules everything around me. They don't care. They don't, they're killing the sport. They're killing, it's, just, it's like cattle, right? When you go to make meat, you go, you take the, they're taking the sport out back. They're shooting it to sell to the TV, to ESPN, to CBS, to NBC, to Fox. Bid on it. Take the meat. They're not going to be here. These 80s, these, you know, these high-ranking officials on NCAA or, you know, the CFP, they're not going to be here in 10 years. They don't care. They're trying to fund their retirement funds. They're trying to build that up. They don't care. This is not for the good of the sport. 
they they don't care. So yesterday's attempted assassination of the ACC and really probably successful assassination of the ACC, that was meticulous. That was deliberate. That was very deliberate. There's only two conferences that matter now. That's the era we are now in after this. This was the last week of college football as you know it. And yesterday was the, the ending, the climax. So let's talk about the rankings, shall we? Number one, Michigan. Well-deserved. All right, well-deserved. They are the number one team in the country. They should be the number one seed. Won the Big Ten. Undefeated. Took out Ohio State, who many people would argue is one of the quote-unquote best, and I'm going to say this a lot, best four teams. One of the best four teams in the country. Yep. Yeah. I think this first statement. Number two, Washington. Can't keep them out, right? Even though I know it probably really hurt. It probably really hurt the committee to have to put Wash. I know it probably, they were dying inside having to put Washington on that sheet of paper or put it into the, I mean, they probably choked up a little bit about the fact they had to put a Pac-12. They had no choice but to put a Pac-12 team. If they didn't have to put Washington in, they would have probably looked for a reason to not put Washington. I just know it killed them to have to put them in. But Washington, in the actual, all right, not the perceived living off reputation best conference in college football this year. But if you actually watched the games, if you actually looked at the rankings, quote unquote, and if you looked at the quality of the teams, the actual best conference in the country this year was the Pac-12. So naturally the team that ran the table, ran the gauntlet, beat everybody there was to beat in that conference. Deserves to be there and Washington is there at number two. Number three, as a result of Georgia taking that L, there was going to be an open spot. And since Texas did beat Alabama, and I know it hurt for them to put Texas out above Alabama here at three, they still had to put the horns, had an impressive performance, beat the brakes off Oklahoma State, even though they did lose to Oklahoma. But Texas looked good, all right? Looked good enough, I guess. And they're Texas. They're going to be an SEC team, team anyway, all right? Basically an SEC team, good enough for us, all right? Texas goes number three. They deserve to be there. Got no problem with it. Number four. And number four came down to three teams, of course. Georgia, or excuse me, let me do this correctly. Georgia, Florida State, and Alabama. And there was never a question. There was never a question. And honestly, it didn't come down to Alabama who won the SEC championship and Florida State who went undefeated and won the ACC championship. It never came down to that. No, that was clearly... Between Georgia and Alabama, it was whoever won the SEC championship was getting in. We foresaw this coming. Let's be honest. Well, at least I did. Foresaw this coming. Florida State was getting screwed. It was dead in the water from the moment this matchup was made. It was dead in the water. Florida State was getting screwed. So number four was Alabama, the great golden child, the golden goose, the favored spoiled kid of college football, the Alabama Crimson Tide were number four. And I want to preface this because this is probably going on TikTok and Alabama fans are going to be at my throat for how I've introed this. But I actually think Alabama deserves to be in a playoff if it was expanded, right? They deserve to compete. They've had a great year. They've overcome a lot of obstacles in terms of they were not a very good team. They were not a very good team. They look like a multi-loss team at the beginning of this year, but Nick Saban is the GOAT, all right? He is the GOAT for a reason, and he got this team going. Milrow, despite being the most volatile player in college football, has made improvements. The offense is still shaking, but that defense is the truth. That front seven, I've talked endlessly. I've talked endlessly about the Alabama. I love the Alabama front seven. I really love the Alabama defense. Caleb Downs is going to be a special player. I think he's going to be one of the definitive defensive back players. Like, once he gets to the league, he's going to be one of the, God forbid he gets injured, by the way. Um, which is very ironic considering the current situation. I think he's going to be one of the definitive defensive backs of my generation. I, I, I think Downs is incredible. Terry on Arnold, I've said, is cornerback one and should be in Thorpe conversations pretty much the entire season. I think Cloyd McKinstry is overrated as hell, but T.A. is a monster, right? Him and Downs, dogs, all right? Bama's got some dogs on the defensive side of the ball. I think they should run the ball more offensively and they'd be a little bit more dangerous, but what do I know, all right? They, they, make, they won the SEC They beat Georgia, right? I think they, they're deserving in another scenario. 
They're deserving. And that's not to say that Bamba can't go out and win the national championship. They won't beat Michigan. They won't beat whoever in the national championship. And they'll win this and they'll prove the committee right. I mean, they better. Honestly, since they're in, they better win. I don't want to see them, and they did. I don't want to see a, a three-point or a one-point win. Bama, if, if Bama is back, as the committee has labeled it, if Bama is Alabama, as they have given the reason for them being in, then they better murk everybody. I want a blowout of Michigan. You, I don't want a game winner. That's not good enough. You're Bama, right? That's why you're in. You better boat race Michigan, and you better boat race whoever's in the national championship. And if you lose, I don't want it to be a little one-score game. I mean, or excuse me, I, it better be like a one-score game. It better be a three-point or one-point loss. You better, they better scrape by. You get beat by more than one score, then I'm going to have very, very strong questions for the college football committee, more than I have right now, about why it is that Bama is, is in. And the justification Boo Corrigan gave was that we took the four best teams. I have a couple questions. I, I have a couple questions for the committee, yeah? We took the four best teams, correct? That's, that's what you said. The four best teams. Why was Florida State four last week and not four this week? If you think that Bama... And I guess we'll get to Georgia, right? If you think that Bama's better than Florida State, what changed? Just because they beat Georgia, right? So you didn't think that Bama could beat Florida State last week? Or you don't think Ohio State, just throwing some teams out here, you don't think Ohio State's better than Florida State? Or Oregon's better than Florida State? In their current state? No pun intended. I'm just saying, if you're taking the best four teams... Right? And by the way, is Ohio State not one of the best four teams just because they lost to Michigan? The number one team in the country, they're not one of the best four teams? Are, are they not better potentially than one of the other teams that are listed? I mean, if we're taking the best four teams, of course. And how about the flip side of this? If Bama was in this situation, if Milroy had gone down and and, you know, they were down to the third string quarterback and they scraped by, you know. If the team names were reversed and this wasn't your golden child, would Florida State be in instead of Alabama? Because I don't think so. I think the story would be, man, that Bama defense. Man, the way that the Alabama Crimson Tide and Nick Saban did it again. Look at how they persevered and, and overcame obstacles. What a team. We can't deprive that team of being in the college football playoff. I think that's what... Your story would be. And honestly, let's go further. I don't think it really mattered. I think if Alabama lost to Auburn, which, by the way, they almost did for speaking of teams that scraped by, if Auburn wasn't incompetent, if that DB had turned around and picked the ball off or batted it away, then Alabama would have lost to an Auburn team with a quarterback, Peyton Thorne, that went 5 for 16, 56 yards in two picks and would have lost they won by sheer luck and insanity because anything can happen in college football that's how they scrape by Auburn who aren't even going bowling this year but they were the epitome of dominance over the past couple weeks apparently that's what I've been told God forbid we talk about that Texas A&M game or the Arkansas game from earlier this year since you know close games are a black mark on a team God, God forbid, God forbid, we talk about superstar quarterback Jalen Milrow getting benched. Heisman candidate Jalen Milrow. God, God forbid, we talk about the lack of talent Bama actually has. If you, if you walk, talk about the lack of an offensive line they have. God, God forbid, God forbid we do that. God forbid we go there. So let's continue, yeah? Because if Bama lost to Auburn and I don't know. Then they beat Georgia. They would have still been in. They'd have still beat Florida. They'd have still been in for Florida State. Even with two losses, they'd have still been in. If Georgia had lost this game and Bama had lost against Auburn, Georgia with one loss still would have been in for Florida State. And honestly, if Jordan Travis hadn't broke his leg, 
and it really come down to it, I'm not convinced that Florida State still wouldn't be out. Because they were never, they were never keeping an SEC team out. They were never keeping Alabama. Georgia's just a caveat of their dominance over the past two years. They're just there because, you know, they're SEC and they've been very good. So, you know what? They get a little bit of the privilege. But none of the privilege that comes with being Alabama. Oh, oh, no. No, 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 no. Two loss Alabama makes it because they're Bama. And they played in the SEC. You know, regardless of the fact that the SEC was not that great this year, regardless of the fact that the ACC was actually 6-4 and four against the SEC this year, it doesn't matter. This is Alabama, right? We've seen them do it time after time again, despite the fact that Boo Corrigan came out of the side of his mouth yesterday in his reasoning and said, historical conversations don't really matter. You know, we're not thinking about that. But, you know, everybody's talking about today, man, it's Alabama. So, you know, we can't just leave Alabama out of the playoff in the circumstances. Right? So are we using it or are we not? I'm, I'm a little bit confused there. It didn't matter. Florida State was getting screwed regardless. It didn't matter how you cut it. They were never leaving their favorite child out. Because all that matters is that you play in one or two conferences. The Big Ten or the SEC. And if you wipe away this last year of cultural ball as we know it, there's only two conferences really represented in this year's playoffs. And ladies and gentlemen at home, what two conferences are those? the SEC, and the Big Ten. This is your new reality. And it doesn't matter that we're going to 8 to 12. It doesn't matter. Because the majority are still going to be SEC and Big Ten. It doesn't matter about the quality of those conferences. It doesn't matter. They're the only two that matter. That's, that's, that's what we've learned today, which is what we've known. But it doesn't matter. And really, the Big Ten is just there because they made the right decision. Shout out to Kevin Warren. I believe he's still the commissioner of the Big Ten because he made great decisions to persevere and keep the Big Ten alive. But really, it only matters if you're in the SEC. It doesn't matter how bad the SEC is. As long as the SEC has the name, the SEC, they will be fine. They will be fine. This will always be their invitational because that's what this is. This is not a rankings. This is not a playoff. This is an SEC invitational, all right? It's the SEC champion. And then honestly, if we can... All right, unless we absolutely, you know, incredible circumstances like this year with the rest of the teams, we're going to throw another SEC team in there. All right, because it's the best conference. Even when we're not the best conference, we're the best conference. It just matters more. It just matters more. That's a tagline made up by ESPN, by the way, for SEC. But it's never rang truer than it does today. Alabama is a great team. They're, they're a really good team. And like I said, in an expanded playoff, they deserve they deserve to be here. They won the SEC championship, beat Georgia, even though I don't think Georgia is what they were, even though we keep saying 30, you know, 30 game, 30 game, 30 game. You know, and by the way, this isn't Death Star Alabama. So a lot of people are like, oh, did you see Michigan's reaction? They got to play Bama. Why? Why should anybody fear this Bama team? For anybody that's actually watched an Alabama game, why should anybody fear this Alabama team? They got a really good defense. I can see a little bit of fear maybe there. They could grind out a win, really Big Ten style, ironically. But why? Why should you fear Bama? With a quarterback that can either throw a touchdown or throw a pick at a moment's notice, with a running game without any true stars that, you know, is really hot and cold because of the way it's called, shout out to Tommy Reese. A receiving court made of one man and then occasional contributors who can't decide if they want to catch a ball that game or not. Or the number one corner in the country, allegedly, who keeps getting burnt on a consistent basis, despite the fact that Downs and Arnold try to clean it up for him. Why should we be scared of Bama this year? Why? What, what makes them Alabama, since this is Death Star Alabama? I, I would love for anybody to answer that question. Besides, it's just Nick Saban, and we're Alabama, since that's not supposed to be part of the criteria, even though it very clearly appears to be. I would, I would love to know. I would love to know. But college football has died as we know it. This was the end of an era, and there's no other way it could go besides the ACC being killed, Florida State being screwed, and Alabama, as always, getting what they want because it's the SEC, and it just matters more. Might as well keep the college train going, honestly. All right? College basketball. 
I'm a little bit less pissed off, right? That was a very long segment. If you just skipped ahead, welcome. Welcome to the rest of the podcast. Um, that segment was probably the longest segment in the history. But I think it was very deserving of its own little, you know, stretch we got there. But anyways, college basketball, like I said, all right? That's what you're here for. North, this was the death of every ranked team, all right? This was a gruesome weekend. It was upsets galore. We got a lot to go do, so let's get to it. Northwestern beats Purdue. Number one, Purdue falls as usual. They are a great November team, but the rest of the year, they are just Purdue. And boy, were they just Purdue. 92 to 88, they get the win. Uh, Boo Booey, which is a fantastic name for Northwestern, gets 31 to 9 here in overtime. Ty Berry has 21, Langborg has 20, and they lead them over Purdue, who, listen, besides Zach Eady, he needed some help, and he did not have it. All right, he did not have it in this game. Northwestern continues to be, I mean, where did they come from? A couple years ago, they were in the cellars of the Big Ten, and now it's back-to-back years where they've beaten Purdue at home, and they've looked dangerous. So credit where credit's due to what they're doing at Northwestern, really building that program. They upset Purdue again. We had a ring matchup, too. Kansas and UConn that same day. Kansas gets to win 69-65 over UConn. Of course, they were missing Stephon Castle. But nonetheless, Kansas continues to prove why they are currently the class of college basketball. And Bill Self is the best coach in college basketball. Kevin McCuller, a lot of people would tell you he is the best player on that Kansas team, even over Hunter Dickinson. And he showed why in this game. All right, 21 points. He was big time, big time defensively as well. Did a little bit of everything. But of course, that 21 led all scores for Kansas and was a big reason why they got it done. However, the best player on the court was Tristan Newton. But like I said, Donovan Klingon, Ghost Town, and no stuff on Castle, that's going to be a killer for UConn. You've got to have more. If you want to be like they were last year, right? If you want to repeat, you got to have that same contribution level without a true superstar that appears on this team. Even though Newton played like a superstar in this game, you got to have those contributors all come together for it. And they did not have that. And they take the L early season, though, to Kansas, who looks like, well, Kansas. Wisconsin upsets Marquette, who had risen to the number three team in the country, but like I said, it was up seat weekend, so that's how it goes. Wisconsin gets it done 76 to 64. This is a really good rivalry, all right? This is a very good low key rivalry in college, very competitive games um, over the past couple of years, and yeah, Whiskey gets it done. Max Klesman has 21. They had four starters in double figures for the Badgers. Yeah, just a phenomenal game. Marquette, you're not going to win a game, a game in the 21st century at least, when you shoot 24% from three. Seven for 29. It was the killer for Marquette. A couple more of those threes, you win this game. But the inefficiency was a killer. Wisconsin, great defense, by the way. Got to give credit where credit's due. And they pull off the upset. <sighs> It's going it, to, I feel like we might be, like, I, I cheered on Carolina's downfall last year, and now I feel like it might be our turn, all right? Because we've now lost two straight games. Georgia Tech takes Duke off the map, um, 72 to 68. That Mitchell Tech ended up being a killer. We got the momentum back, looked like we could pull this off, and that was just a killer, all right? That was just a killer that we never came back from, and then Flip gets cooked on back-to-back possessions. It's just, it was rough. And it's the same problem I've mentioned with this team earlier. We don't have that superstar that we know we can go to and shut the game down. We don't have that. And we're too young, it appears, right now. Those kids, they just haven't grown up. Foster wasn't bad, but I don't know why Jared McCain is starting. I like Jared. I hope he becomes a great player. But I honestly do not know why Jared McCain is starting. Over Caleb Foster, at least. Like, surely. Surely he is not balling like that in practice compared to the games where he has to be the starter. Like, I, I don't completely understand that one yet. Um, oh, and by the way, Tyrese Proctor got injured like a minute into this game. So just, you know, great time. Just a great time for Duke. They are looking like they might be in for a hell of a season. Hopefully we do not lose Cooper Flag. I think everybody signed. Hopefully nobody asked. this game gotta give a big shout out to him showing up on the big time 27 and 10 as well not just that reed shepherd has been the best freshman which i don't think anybody really expected reed shepherd to be the best freshman on this kentucky team with all of the five stars that they had but reed was a five star at least a borderline four star at the end um 
So maybe we should have seen this coming. But yeah, Reed looking like his daddy. Stunt like his daddy. He balling out right now. He's been the best freshman. 25, 9, and 6. They had no DJ Wagner in this game, which of course is a, a, big, a pretty sizable loss for this Kentucky team. But I think Reed did a pretty good job in his absence. I think Rob Dillingham, who had an awful game, is going to do this, where he's going to have games where he wins you the game because he goes nuclear and drops 20 or 30. But then those games where he has, you know, he goes 3 for 11 like he did um, against Wilmington are going to be games you're going to want back. And I think this is going to be a game that Kentucky's going to want back. Big upset early on for UNCW. Credit where credit's due. We also had the upsets bleed just a little bit. All right, Just a little bit into the women's game on the weekend. Gonzaga took out Stanford, who we've sang the praises of this year. 96-78, their first win over a top five team. Cambrink was the difference in the fact that she was absent. All right, She was sick. Um, was visibly sick, even though she started off perfect in this game, but once she was gone, that was it. Yvonne Ajim feasted without her, 27-12. and 12. Brianna Maxwell had 27 as well for Gonzaga. And yeah, they just, you know, without that interior presence, without the best player arguably in college basketball this year, it was over for Stanford, all right? They don't have a lot of, you know, front court depth as is and you know just kind of how that went down it was it was it was wraps all right they need Brink to be successful and without her they're just another team and you saw that this weekend now entertainment nothing really happened this week in entertainment i'm not going to sit here and lie to you ladies and gentlemen all right we got a tease they dropped the ep the world ep finn will um it was very good very, very good. One of my favorite, I guess, albums of the year. I'm not going to have a rating for it, but I talked about that a lot in the reaction video. So if you want to go watch that, you can do that as I react to uh, the Crazy Form MV and talk a little bit about the album. So you can go to that. It was a big week for trailers, though. Uh, House of the Dragon looks fire. The Boys Season 4, need it. And Godzilla vs. Kong, which looks ridiculous, but I will be in the movie theaters for that. Legendary, congratulations. You got your franchise. Also, how in the hell did Kong get the Infinity Gauntlet? I don't know, but I will be seated, okay? I will be seated. It was a big week. I don't know if it's because the strikes and this was just like the perfect timing, but a lot, a lot, a lot of trailers for some elite level content coming out. Um, very excited for the new year. Not just because I need a new year to come because this has been the most challenging year of my life, but just because, uh, yeah, hopefully we can get back to business and more TV will be back. But yeah, really quick entertainment segment to go on. That brings us to the National Football League. All right, the NFL, and it was another Thursday night game for the Dallas Cowboys, and it was a great game. I mean, it was a great game, great back and forth game. Seattle was up 35 to 27 in that fourth quarter. They were looking good, and then Dallas just said, absolutely not. Brandon Aubrey, and then Jake Ferguson, who has been a, a, rele a relevation as a rookie um, for the Dallas Cowboys, with the Dallas Cowboys. I'm still in Ohio State's thing. And Brandon Aubrey hit that, you know, just kind of game sealer, and then we held it down defensively. Uh, Deron Bland, after we caught him, Depoy um, did not have a great game. All right, DK Metcalf went off uh, for six receptions, 134, and a hat trick. Oh, by the way, he was trash talking in sign language, telling people to stand on business in sign language. Tough. All right, Gino had 334 and three touchdowns in this game. Um, not a terrific game run wise for Seattle, but when the passing game, when Gino and DK are linked up like that, that's just deadly. However, the Cowboys, like I said, Dak Prescott for MVP, 299 and a hat trick for Dak. Um, need I say more? Need I say more? MVP. M. V. P. Put some respect on my boy's name. C.D. Lamb is still C.D. Lamb. 12 receptions, 116 on a touchdown. The boy better be an all-pro this year. He has taken the leap. He should be up there with Tyreek, in my opinion. All right? In my personal opinion. Jake Ferguson, like I said, has been a dog as a rookie. Six receptions, 77 yards, and a touchdown. If there's an all-rookie team, he needs to be on it for the tight end position. Alongside Sam Laporta, who we will get to because he bought out this week for Detroit. And yeah, um, Micah Parsons doing Micah Parsons things. Didn't get a sack in this game, but still, that game still at the end was just perfect. Dayron Band did get another pick. So uh, yeah, D-Boy's still up, but he got shredded. It's a crazy fan experience, by the way, having two Trevon Diggs on the same team. Like, where it could be one game where they just get torched, and then just another game where they take over. It's, it's a crazy experience, but it's also very fun. And it's kind of sick, honestly. It's kind of sick in like a sick, twisted way in terms of like it can be stressful but also exciting. 
But I'll take it. All right, I'll take it. Cowboys get the win. A really good win against the Seahawks team who look like they're back on track. If you watch the Chargers and Patriots game, you may need a refund, okay? Especially if you paid money to see this game. I honestly think you deserve a refund. There was six points in this game. They all came in the second quarter. This was one of the worst football games of the year. College, NFL, hell, maybe even high school, okay? I can't even say, like, this was like a scintillating defensive battle. It was just an ugly, horrific offensive game, all right? Just disgusting. 29 yards rushing for the Chargers, 148, though, for the Patriots, um, who are just a big, they're, they're Iowa without the elite defense. Even though they played technically elite defense, I guess, so to speak, in this game, all right? They're, they're Iowa. Offensively, they're Iowa. We're going to run the ball a bunch. Ramon J. Stevenson, who gets hurt in this game. Great for my fantasy team. It's Jover. It's Jover. I mean, it's, it's, it's ugly. All right? They have no idea what to do with quarterback. They will be picking one of the quarterbacks very, very early. Probably Drake or Caleb. Um, um, and they need it desperately because Zap was garbage. Jay Herbo was not really Jay Herbo. The offense was not that great. They did have five sacks, though. Eric Kendricks had 10 tackles and a sack, so there you go. But, yeah, just one of the worst games of the year. Just god-awful. The Pittsburgh Steelers are sometimes frauds. Sometimes they find ways to win. They were frauds this week. The Arizona Cardinals get them done 24-10, to which is not necessarily great for the tank, but this was the James Conner revenge game. 105 yards and two touchdowns for Conner. Kyler had some great improvisation. I think... Trey, Trey McBride has said, by Zach Ertz, go be a family man. Go, go take care of the kids, all right, with Julie. Because I got five receptions, 89 yards, and a touchdown for McBride. He's been great the past two weeks. Mitch wasn't bad. He had a play for uh, Pickett, who got injured in this game. I forget exactly what Pickett's injury was. But, yeah, he got knocked out of this game early, and the Steelers suffered for it. Alex Highsmith did ball out, though. One and a half sacks for the former Charlotte alum. Shout out to the 704. But the Cardinals do get the win 24-10. The Colts win the beat the Titans in overtime. All they had to do was hit that extra point. All they had to do was hit that extra point. I don't know if it was Tannehill. I don't know if it was just Folk being a bum or what it was. All right, But that extra point comes back to haunt them because of course it did. And they lose because Michael Pittman, Michael Pittman walks it off on the four-yarder from Gardner Minshew. And the Colts win the game 31 to 28. Uh, Minshew played a great game, 312 and two touchdowns. Michael Pittman Jr. continues to break out as of recent. 11 receptions, 105 and a touchdown. was on a very complete performance a very complete performance and a huge performance i think from the colts very impressive king Henry had 102 and two touchdowns before he got knocked out but yeah levis those turnover bottles that he felt at kentucky translated in this game and it gave colts opportunities and of course that makes such a point came back to haunt them titans get that wit oh wait no they don't the colts get the win 31 to 28 uh yeah texans get it done 22 to 17 over the broncos uh it was a field goal bonanza, all right? Just a whole lot of unfinished drives to really kind of start and begin this game. But ultimately, if your quarterback throws three interceptions, you're not going to be able to win. I don't know who let Russ cook this week, but he was not cooking anything of any significance as the Broncos take the L, 17-22. Um, Nico Collins bought out from a fantasy team, so that's that was dope. But uh, besides that... Pretty normal game for the Texans, honestly. Not really too much to talk about. I know we, we talk about them every week and praise them, but, I mean, this was just a very good win. Stroud kind of closed it out. A very physical game, by the way. Very, very physical. Um, speaking of physicality, that poor, poor sideline worker that got his leg snapped by Alvin Kamara after he got knocked out of bounds. Prayers to you. But the Lions do get the win 33-28 to because the Saints are, in fact, frauds, and the Lions are back to business. Goff had a much better game this week, 213, even though it's not as gaudy numbers-wise, a much better game than the Thanksgiving game, 213 and two touchdowns. Um, Monty did his thing, 56 yards and a touchdown, average Monty game. Uh, Sam Laporta, we said we won't talk about him. I think he broke the rookie reception record for a tight end. 
Iowa Factory. Nine receptions, 140, and a touchdown. That's crazy. I just thought about that. Because they had Hawkinson, right? They just traded in Iowa tight ends. That's that's so crazy. I just realized that. That's, that's funny. That's very funny. Um, ARSB also got in the box. But, yeah. I mean, y'all know the deal. Detroit is a good team. All right? Despite referring back to Lions ways on Thanksgiving, they are still a very good team at the end of the day. Uh, Derek Carr was not the answer for New Orleans, and that has become very apparent as they benched him for Jameis Winston in this game. But that still didn't win him the game. Lions get it done. If you watch the Falcons and the Jets, similar to the Patriots, uh, the AL, the AL, oh my gosh, the AFC East is disgusting. At the bottom, it's absolutely rank. Okay, the Dolphins are like okay. Honestly, the Dolphins are good, very fun team to watch. The Bills sometimes, um, but the Patriots and the Jets, oh my, ugh. <coughs> oh my gosh, disgusting. I mean, just disgusting, egregious. 13 to 8. All right, just a disgusting game. Absolutely rank, okay? Aaron Rodgers, by the way, might be back. I hope his Achilles is actually fixed, or this is going to be a horrifying moment when he takes that first drop back and that thing just snaps again, all right? So I really do hope he is Wolverine and that thing is healed, or that's going to get really ugly since it appears he is hellbent on calling me back this season from an injury that usually takes up to a year to heal from. And that's really the only thing of note, because that's just this was just a hey, let's all forget about this game. Alright, good win, Falcons. Commanders still suck. Dolphins still good. 45 to 15. Uh yeah, Cheetah had three receptions, 123, and two touchdowns at one point in this game. That should pretty much tell you how this goes. The commanders are essentially tanking after they blew up their team at the trade deadline. So you know how this goes. Tua goes 18 for 24, 280 and two touchdowns. A chain, who pretty much did this all in the second half, had 73 and two touchdowns. So, fantasy owners around the world, if you didn't bench him this week, welcome back. Cheetah finished with five receptions, 157 and two touchdowns. And like I said, um, Andrew Van Ginkle had a pick six, and the commanders got mangled. They are tanking, and it is pretty, 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 pretty blatant. Uh, Tampa Bay takes out the Carolina Panthers 21 to 18, despite Bryce Young's best efforts. Um, except for that last play. Honestly, he played a very solid in game until that horrific decision he made to essentially seal up the game for the Buccaneers where he just threw that up, hopes and prayers, and Antoine Winfield Jr., one of the best safeties on the planet, read it like a book and picked it off. And that was pretty much the game. But solid game back and forth. I think the Buccaneers left them in this game way too long for a team of Carolina's caliber who are 1-11. Of course, currently the worst team in the league. But, you know, touch and go, credit where credit's due. Chubba Hubbard had 104 and two touchdowns. It was honestly one of the best games we've seen. Still, even with the loss, this was one of the best games this year from the Panthers in terms of a team performance. Honestly, if Burns doesn't get too caught up in the emotions and doesn't throw that punch, maybe he's there to make a play late. And the Panthers do win. But that's just not how it fell out. Um, Mike Evans, by the way, hit 1,000 yards for the 10th time. All right, you can always count on a couple of different things in this life, and one of those is Mike Evans getting a hundred yards, se a thousand yards season. Excuse me. He had 162 and some receptions with a touchdown. Shout out to Mike Evans. Honestly, might end up being a Hall of Famer purely off of the numbers, because yeah, he has been the model of consistency. Him and Keenan Allen have been the models of consistency at that position for a very, very long time. So yeah, shout out to Mike Evans. Give him Mike his flowers. All right, and what was supposed to be the game of the week, but really it was only the game of the week if you're a San Francisco 49er fan or just an Eagles hater like me, here we go. 42 to 19. I don't think anybody expected this, though. 42 to 19, the 49ers take out the Eagles. Uh, this was a mauling. Brock Purdy looked like MVP Brock Purdy this week. 314 and four touchdowns for Purdy. Dominant game. CMC was, you know, doing CMC stuff, which is over 100 yards receiving and rushing. And a touchdown because he scores every week. Debo Samuel. Woo! Woo! 138 yards total. Four receptions, by the way. 116 and two touchdowns. He also had a rushing touchdown. Debo went off. All right, Debo went off. Even more than CMC and even more than Purdy, Debo Samuel took over this game and was the reason. He is that guy. He is worth every penny to this 49ers team. It has been night and day. We saw how bad and grimy it got for the 49ers when he was gone. 
With him back, this team is just completely different. He is the X factor on this team. He was the X factor in this game. And they look like the best team in the NFC, which is what a lot of people thought they were before the Eagles went on this run. And they went on that losing streak without Debo. Javon Klinlaw, Clint, yeah, Javon Klinlaw, two sacks in this game, four tackles. He was a great job. Um... You know, defensively on that defensive line that we talk about every week with the 49ers and how stacked it is. Ken Law, just another dominant piece, another college football legend, now just a monster, you know, on that San Francisco wall um, or nightmare or whatever you really want to call it. Uh, MVP. MVP Hurts actually had to throw the ball this week. Yeah, he threw it 45 times for 298 and a touchdown, but was not perfect. All right, he had a touchdown in this game, but they get sacked three times, like I said. A.J. Brown... That drop was so costly. So, so costly. Ultimately, it didn't decide the game, 42-19. to But still, that would have been a big way for the Eagles to get back. But just too many drops. Eight receptions, 114. Devontae Smith had nine receptions, 96 yards, and a touchdown. He was honestly the best offensive player in the game, in my opinion, for the Eagles. He played a really, really good game. Got some good separation. Of course, got that touchdown in the end zone. Four receptions, 105, and a touchdown for Puka. Demarcus Robinson had that one. Oh, man. I hate that because that was such a, a rough call on that, that Puka touchdown. I got called back. So, yeah, that sucked. But he still had a solid game as well, I wanted to say. Kobe Turner had a half sack and five tackles defensively. And the Rams get it done. And to end off, the Packers get it done 27-19 on Sunday Night Football. The Chiefs, man, they just don't – they're missing something, which is an elite receiver, which we said multiple times. But it just – they're just missing something. It, it's so blatantly that they're missing something, and even though we've said what they're missing, it's just they can't flip that switch all the way, right? We've seen them flip the switch or start slow like they did in this game and then turn it on and beat that team. We saw it last week, right? They could not flip the switch. They could not flip the switch. Credit where credit's due to the Packers, by the way, and Jordan Love, who continues to be very good. I, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. He had that one stretch where he cooled down a little bit. But besides that, Love has been very, very good. 267 and three touchdowns for Love in this game. Outplayed Patrick Mahomes. Um, and yeah, like I said, Chiefs are just, they don't have that element. I don't think they're a Super Bowl contender, to be honest. Even with them being the Chiefs and having Mahomes and Kelsey. I don't think it is. But yeah, Simone Biles wins the Battle of the Wags versus Taylor Swift. Both of them were in tenants. And the NFL's media ratings probably did a pretty solid number last night uh, with both of them there. But Packers get the more important win. And with that said, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to Roundup, which is really just soccer and combat sports this week. Ryan Garcia returns to the ring, and he got his get back, all right? Oscar Duarte. Him versus uh, Golden Boy, which is really what this was, all right? This was Ryan versus Oscar De La Hoya and Bernard Hopkins. And Garcia won. All right, he won. It wasn't his best performance. It wasn't the cleanest performance. But you know what? He It's funny. It's ironic. Duarte was talking all that stuff about how Ryan quit, and then Ryan made him quit. He tried to do that last thing where, yeah, I'm going to get up at the last second, make it look like it's controversial. But let's be real, brother. You had no fight left in you. And if he'd have let you in there, you would have got knocked out worse, which in the UFC, which we're about to talk about, could have happened. It could have been you this week, but it wasn't. All right, Ryan gets the KO in the round eight. Of course, um, I think he's still, you know, 
his talent is undeniable. I just want to see him continue to get better so he can really be a part because I think he'd be a very, very fun, even more so than he is now. Um, reach his potential and be a fun part of what could be a really fun generation for boxing um, with all these guys around the same age and just kind of moving up the divisions. So, yeah, Ryan gets a KO. He needed his get back. He got it. UFC. This was the old-timers card. So many former champions, so many legends, so many probably future Hall of Famers or whatever. This was the OGs card, all right? And the OGs nearly died on it, all right? Armand with a vicious KO of Benil. Benil was down for a very, very long time, but I'm pretty sure as of 106 right now, it is on December 4th. He did eventually wake up, which is a good thing. But yeah, Armand makes a statement. KO's Benil. Uh, Jalen Turner's KO of Bobby Green. He killed him. The ref let Bobby die. He took years. He tried to end Bobby's career. All right? The ref tried to end his career. All right? After he was down that first shot, you should have called it off. All right? It was done. But he let him get about 10 super necessaries in before he said, Hey, there's no pulse. There's no more brain activity. He's dead. All right? Stop the fight. Protect the fighter. I know sometimes I and we get mad about these early stoppages when they happen. But honestly, that's better than watching a man nearly just get killed. All right? In the way that Bobby Green almost died in the ring or the octagon, should I say, on Saturday night. All right? That was just, that was brutal. All right? That was horrific refereeing. I don't know if he should be refereeing another fight because that was just bad. All right? But great tail, great, great kill by Jalen Turner. Um, Devinson Figueredo. All right? Figgy. Look really good at 145. All right, UD's Rob Font, who's one of the contenders at 145 for a very long time, and Figgy looked really good. The power translated. May even got enhanced with him, you know, gaining weight and going up. So uh, yeah, I think Figgy could definitely be a factor at 145. We gonna see, but he looked very, very good. Prim. All right, let's talk about the Prim. More importantly, let's talk about Trent Alexander Arnold and how he is once again the best fullback. Probably could be one of the best midfielders in the world at this point. But, uh, yeah, TAA, he's on fire. He had a brace against Fulham and what essentially served as the game winner. He has been cooking. All right, he's been cooking. Manu and PSG are fighting for their lives in the Champions League. I know we haven't had a Champions League segment in a while um, just because we've had so much other things going on. But still, we are still locked in. All right, but they are fighting for their life. All right, next week we will be bringing back the Champions League segment and talking about it. Because, uh, yeah, I think that's the last match day, and Man U has to win. PSG basically has to win. So, yeah, two top teams, two of the most talked about teams, fighting for their lives. Garnacho is playing on fire right now, playing out of his mind. So, yeah, shout out to young Alejandro Garnacho. And Mbappe is still Mbappe for PSG, but, yeah, they need to get it together. I know Newcastle has their number, but, man, they are playing it close in the group of death. And with that said, ladies and gentlemen... I hope you guys enjoyed a historical, a historical episode because of the college football segment and that 20-minute rant I went on for the college football committee. But, hey, at least we know. Like I said, at least we know now. But, hope you guys enjoyed. See you next week. 175. I do want to say shout out to my friends. I had a great weekend. I had one of the best weekends. I know I've talked about it a little bit. Not been a great year for me. Um, honestly, probably could say it's been the worst year of my life if we're talking personally. But, uh, weekends like the past one... You know, despite everything that happened with sports, uh, you know, are, are good for the soul. All right. And this past weekend was good for the soul. A little bit happier this week. Got some things cooking. So we'll see what happens. But for episode 174, hope you guys enjoyed. Ocho, signing off.